So I'm Wesley. I'm from Sci5. I'm here to talk to you today about Tilink, uh, which is our on-chip protocol. When I first started at Sci5, uh, we already had Rocket and a bunch of cores and a lot of lo different IP blocks. But our CTO, Yunsup, said to me, you know, we want to build SOCs, so we need a way to put those things together. We had, uh, we had to have an interconnect. So if we're going to build, we already knew we wanted to start small and build bigger chips as we went on. So we were going to need a bus that did coherent uh, cache block motion and uh, worked for small chips and large chips. So we sat down and asked ourselves, what are we going to need? Oh, there's more here. So we knew right away that since the whole goal of uh, Sci-5 and risk in general is to have an open ecosystem, we were going to need it to be an open standard, whatever we picked for a bus protocol. Uh, what's not quite as obvious is that we also really needed it to be very easy to implement, because half the power of open source in the open source world is that people can collaborate because there's a common ground and it's easy to use. Right? If you have a complicated bus, it's going to be very difficult collaborate. So it's really important that whatever bus we use is simple. Uh, of course, because we want to have multi-core, we also needed it to have um, cache coherency. And we wanted to have multiple layers, because we wanted to scale it up from the very small to the very large. Um, and of course, you know, we had some performance concerns. So we went through the list, and we're like, well, what are our options? I mean, HP is, of course, completely inappropriate for this. Um, it is an open standard, though. Uh, Wishbone, a uh, protocol I used quite a bit before coming to Sci-5, is a little bit better in that it's certainly one of the easier protocols you can use, but unfortunately it doesn't have cache coherency in the sense that you can move cache blocks around. Um, Axie 4 is in a similar boat uh, with the additional downside of being from a competitor who probably doesn't like RISC-V. Uh, ACE at least has some coherency, but it's not really clear how you do multiple levels of cache with that protocol. And you can't use it off-chip, which is something we would want to do longer term. And finally, if you look at, there's the, the Chai uh, spec that's from ARM. They claim it's open, but well, uh, this is what I've seen in the last two years I've tried to get it from their website. So it's not really clear uh, whether it even meets our needs because you can't get the spec. So is that an open standard? I would say no, right? Um, Another thing is it has to be easy to implement. Like I said, if we're going to try and work together on a bunch of IP blocks and interoperate, it's really important that the protocol get to the heart of what you actually need and not have a whole bunch of extra work to use, even if that comes at a minor performance cost, although I don't think we have one. Uh, so at ACE, you've got 10 different probe type messages, and that's just for the probes. I mean, you have all these different messages for actually getting blocks and releasing them. So it's not that, not that simple a protocol. It also splits the control and data, which is another level of complexity, has narrow bursts and a bunch of other misfeatures. So anyway, that's not, that's not very great. And also, like I said before, it doesn't support multiple cache layers, which is something we knew we were going to need. And finally, I think it's pretty foolish to depend on a standard that's controlled by a competitor, because if they wanted to, they could change the standard in a future version to our detriment. Or they could just do like with AMBA 5, where they just don't give you the specs for several years until their competitors have all had a chance to, or sorry, their, their, their colleagues, our competitors, have all had a chance to move forward. So um, Berkeley already had a um, sort of in-house protocol they were using to connect components. That's from my uh, colleague, Henry Cook. Uh, he had made this Tilink protocol. It was an academic project, and it had a lot of nice theoretical properties, and the idea was, well, maybe we should try using that and use it to roll our own. One of the nice things is if we go that route, we can avoid a lot of the pitfalls because there's a lot of history of these protocols. So it's pretty clear what you can and can't do and keep it simple. And another nice thing is we can also decouple the wire protocol from the message protocol. So if you have one message protocol, and it doesn't matter how you serialize it, that means you can use the same protocol within the chip and also off the chip. So you can take your... Uh, you can use the same coherency uh, state machines and logic, and just the, the transport can be different. Um, and of course, we're free from the three-letter company. Uh, and uh, if we designed it for RISC-V in the first place, it means we can have the design be simpler. So if we, we I think everyone here likes RISC. Less instructions is easier to think about, and you can compose them to still get the sorts of things you want to do. And if you're trying to make an easy bus protocol, I think it's important to try and keep it as simple as possible. And that also means keeping the message count down. So 
like you have reduced instruction set computing, maybe we should be aiming for a reduced message protocol coherency. I don't know. Uh, yeah. And also, because of the way we connect the SOC, the technology we use in Rocketship, we can actually assume all the hardware that you hook up in the SOC is going to be trusted because we, we do the, the security checking at the source, not in the network. And finally, since we're mostly concerned in uh, sci fi anyway about caches communicating and, well, and also off-chip, most of the time, though, your transfers are blocked to power size. So this is actually a big simplification when you start trying to improve the QR of your circuits, if you can know it's all power two. So from a, from a big picture view, what does Tilink look like? So it's pretty standard in that it's a master-slave point-to-point -point protocol. So here you've got the master, and it communicates to slaves. But it's explicitly designed to be composable. So you can have agents in the middle that are both a slave and a master. So this could be your master might be an L1. This could be an L2 in the middle, and then an L3 on the bottom. right? So it is point-to-point. -point, and that also applies on the, 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 um, the link layer, too. So like your crossbars are also point-to-point. It's a message-based protocol uh, with five different priorities. So that's important. We'll get to that later. But it's, uh, uh, so we're not, we're not like AHB where we're baking the protocol into how you do the cycle timing, right? That's not, how, that's not how this protocol is designed. Rather, there's messages. And how you transmit those messages, that's like a decision for your uh, on-chip or off-chip bus or whatever your requirements might be, right? Tiling can work with any different kind of serialization. Since we want a simple standard, it's important to have sort of conformance levels so that we can start from very simple devices, and those can still speak Tilink, and you can go all the way up to like uh, an interstitial cache and implement that with the same protocol. So if you want to have that range of uh, complexity, then the protocol has to have sort of steps that you can choose how much of it you're going to implement. And of course, it has to be coherent. And in particular, the nice property we had because it came from academia was that it had already been analyzed to be deadlock free. And it was written in a way that you could compose the multiple cache levels and still have these nice properties. So that's, that's sort of stuff we inherited from the Berkeley project. So this, uh, this bus is already being used. So you can find it's, it's not just got an open spec. It also has open source implementations in the rocket chip repository. Um, in fact, at this point, I think it's fair to say that nearly all of Rocketship is based on Tilink. If you've used Rocketship, you've almost certainly used Tilink. Um, there's over 30 public uh, modules. There's like cores there, of course, Rocket, uh, crossbars, adapters. Uh, it also has a coherency manager, which is sort of like the way ACE does uh, snooping. It's about equivalent to that, uh, but using Tilink. We, of course, have bridges to all the AMBA protocols because as much as we might not like them, they're not going away. So we have converters to all of those and your usual stuff like VIP stuff for monitoring, generating traffic, and a model checker. And uh, to see if you want to know more about how this stuff interacts inside the rocket ship repo, uh, my colleague Henry has a nice paper. That's, uh, if you look at the slides, that's a hyperlink. It'll take you there. Or you just start Google it. Uh, finally, uh, sorry, there's also the uh, sci five blocks repository. That has some more Tiling components. That's where we've got a bunch of uh, slave components that you might want in your uh, SOC. So we've got like open source, I squared C, SPI, UART, G GPIO, PWM. We're going to have probably more slaves in that repository in the future as we develop more of them. Um, they're all open and they're Tiling. So if you need these things, they're pre-built. Um, and finally, Tiling has already been taped out twice. Uh, it's used well, at least, uh, twice by us. I'm sure it's been taped out uh, by other people as well. The FE310, that's, our, um, that's the chip on, on this guy here. This chip here uses it. Uh, so does our upcoming multi-core chip. Uh, the multi-core chip in particular is using a directory-based uh, version of, uh, uh, of an L2. So Tilink works both for directory-based coherency and Snoop-based coherency like ACE. Uh, and it also is wormhole rooted. So this means that like, the protocol is set up so that you can when you get the first, if you have like a message that's fairly long, you can already start transmitting it to the next person before you have all of it. So this helps you shave some latency down instead of storing forward. Um, and finally, we also have uh, used this protocol now with a serialization that goes off chip. So it's not on a serid as yet because we're too cheap. Uh, but it's uh, anyway, it's serialized, and we could put it on a serid as in the future. Um, okay, so I've talked about how Tilink is layered. So these are the, the three layers that we sort of blessed in the specification that you can, you can implement. There's the Tilink uncached lightweight, Tilink uncached heavyweight, and Tilink cached. 
So that's the, the top columns. So all of them, of course, support read and write operations, because otherwise it's not a bus. And that's all you have to support with Tylink UL. So it's very similar to, um, uh, actually, it's even simpler than Wishbone, I would argue. If you're just doing TLUL, you just have to take in one uh, single cycle request to a single cycle answer. And that's all you got to do. There's no multi-beat. The next middle level, that's sort of more along the lines of Axie level uh, protocol. So you've got multi-beat messages. We have some prefetches, because even if you're not using caches, like if you're not speaking the coherent protocol to move cache blocks around, you might still want to do some hints. Like if you're, a, if you're an Axie converter, say, and you, you know there's this big stream of stuff coming from a PCI Express block, you might want to say, oh, uh, you might want to have all that data ready for me when I want to read it out. So you, we've got hints also at this level, even though you're not participating in the coherent protocol. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and finally, you've got the, uh, the full protocol, that's TLC. That adds uh, three additional priorities and the ability to move cache blocks. So I said that Tilink is a message-based protocol, and these are the messages. So you've got on the left here this put full data. That would be a message sent from a master to a slave. So put is a write. So you've got the put full data goes to an access act. The access act is a message sent from the slave back to the master. The arrows in this picture are linking the requests to their responses. So you've got, so the left-hand column there, those are all the uh, messages in the priority A category, and the D column is all the messages in priority D. So you've got, uh, this is in the simplest version again, so this is single beat. You're not, you don't have to do anything except take a request to response in one, uh, from one cycle to one cycle. They don't have, the delay in between is uh, whatever you want. So you've got, um, Put full data, put partial data. At this level of the protocol, those two messages are effectively the same. And then comes the acknowledgement. And you've got get, that's read, and the answer is access act data. So all the message types in Tilink, they say whether or not they carry a data payload. If it has data on the end of the message name, it is a data payload carrying message. So that's the bare minimum you can implement uh, and still be Tilink conform uh, conformant. So the next level is uh, TLUH. So here we add a couple more messages. So you've got the atomic operations, that's the arithmetic data and logical data atomic types. And you've got the, the hints, which are um, uh, things like, I would, I would like you to have this region ready for me to pour data into, or I'd like to have the, this prefetched. Um, we may extend the types of hints you could send in the future, but that's the message type. Uh, another thing I just want to point out while I'm on this slide is that in Talink, every request has a response. But as we'll see in the next slide in TLC, uh, some messages are both a request and a response. So this is the complete protocol. These are all the messages you have. I think you'd be hard pressed to use less. Uh, so you've got acquire over there. Let me just highlight it. So if you wanna, if you wanna get a cache block from outer, uh, the outer memory system, so you're, uh, say you're the L1 and you send to the L2, I'd like to have this cache block. So the message you send is acquire block. It's like, give me that block, it's mine now. Uh, and then you're going to get back a message, which is grant. That comes from the outer cache. He says, here's your block. Uh, and then you have to acknowledge that. So this is a three-message operation. So it's acquire, grant, and then grant acknowledgement. Uh, so the middle one is both a request and a response. Right? Um, the uh, other two operations you need to make a coherent system are to return a block. So when you're, when you're done with it, you want to give it back. That's releasing at the bottom here. So you can release with no data. That's if you didn't change it. You can just release it. Or you can release with data if you dirtied it. And then, of course, you get a release acknowledgment. And the third category in the middle there is probes. That's like, I need to take the block back. And an important feature of the way we set up the priorities here, so there's three priorities going from master to slave and two priorities going from slave to master. We've just, for simplicity, decided to call them five priorities. Uh, that's the A, B, C, D, E. So it's set up in a way that you, can, you, you only have ascending priority as you go through cache block motion. So if you're a cache like um, uh, an L1, and you say, I would like to acquire a block to the L2, that to, to perform that request, it might need to fetch it from a different L1. So the, the probe, it sends to the other L1. It's going to be priority B. The answer is priority C. So now the L2 has the block. And now it gives it to you at priority D with the grant. And finally, you acknowledge that you got it with priority E. So in that way, we can assure forward progress because the operation is completely ascending in priority. And it, this is supplies also as you compose the, uh, the caches, which I'm not going to have time to talk about. 
And the Grant Act, just as a, a final note, the Grant Act is only there because um, I, I had this on an earlier slide. Tilink is an unordered protocol. So you could run this over like a mesh network or something where the message orders can be in, uh, rearranged. So we're, we're aiming for, you would probably want to use Tilink with the weaker memory model that was talked about yesterday. Um, but you need the Grant Act anyway to, to finish the message. Uh, now this is badly explained. If you want a better explanation, it's in the spec. OK. So in addition to keeping the message count to, the, I think, the bare minimum, we also have a couple simplifying assumptions that make the protocol easy to work with. One of them is that there are no loops. So, but it's important to understand what I mean by there's no loops in the graph, because we're not talking about modules. In this picture, it's a bit hard to see, because um, I think the color is bad on this projector. But the, there's those boxes are f filled with a sort of blue. Those are modules. So the, the, the boxes in the picture are modules. And the yellow dots are what we call agents. So an agent corresponds roughly to a, uh, an interface, but also if you're, if you're coupling the flow control or forwarding messages between two interfaces, those are the same agent. So like a crossbar forwards the messages it gets, say, from that Axie bridge over there through uh, the, the crossbar. So that makes it one agent. So it's got uh, one dot. Anyway, the point is that you have cycles here in the module graph. You can see the PCI Express bridge is both a master and a slave. But when you send a message to the slave part of the PCI Express, it doesn't come out the master port. Right? If it did, then, then you would have a cycle, and that would be a problem. So if you build your system in this way, uh, you don't get message loops. That's the main, the main simplifying assumption. And at least in Rocketship, we actually statically verify that's the case before we emit any, any code. Um, so yeah, that's not allowed, as it shows there. You wouldn't be able to put that, because that would break the directed acyclic graph nature of the, the bus. OK, and another simplifying requirement is, like I said, there's those five message priorities, and they're strictly ascending. So if you have sent a B message, you're legitimately able to block A traffic or other B traffic until you get your answer. Um, that can simplify the hardware a lot, because the way the protocol's set up, you know how to slow things down safely. Um, lower priority messages never block higher priority messages. Uh, responses, like I showed you in those five priorities, they have strictly ascending priority. So responses are always higher than the requests. And the simplified protocol only has two priorities. And finally, the last three priorities, you only need them for the cache blocks. Motion. Um, I'm a little short on time. I'm going to skip this one. OK, so uh, on-chip serialization for tiling. So we've talked about tiling as a protocol that you can use over different types of buses. So, but in particular, we have one serialization that we use on-chip for most of rocket chip and most of our chips. That's the one I'm going to talk about now. So this is the wire protocol we use for Tilink on chip. So every message priority has an independent channel in this, in this serialization. But the actual payload they carry is, can be very different. So like the E channel is just like a, I got your message, and here's the number it had. So these channels are very different in size. Um, the messages are transmitted with multiple beats, if you're using TLUH. And you, we use Ready Valid to negotiate the uh, when the beats are transmitted. So this is why it's an on-chip protocol, right? Ready Valid would be an inappropriate signaling mechanism when you have higher latency between the participants. And finally, the, uh, the bus width, of course, is variable. And you can have the response come back on the same cycle or any uh, later number of cycles. And of course, the off-chip protocol makes different choices. All right. So if you have physically independent channels, this is what it's going to look like. You've got the, say, four L1 caches over here. They're speaking TLC, the coherent protocol, to a crossbar. So they've got five channels, right? A, C, and E all go from the master to the slave. And B and D all go from the slave to the master. Uh, and then you also have uh, the coherent protocol to the L2. So this, the crossbar is not like participating in block ownership, but it is forwarding to the L2, which is. And then the L2 is only talking to DR. It's the last level cache here. So it only needs the TLUH protocol. So it's only got the A priority and the D priority channels. OK, so this is just a quick waveform, because we're, we all know what waveforms look like. So I figure I should show you one. Uh, you've got ready valid uh, uh, here. So you've got like a get message. This is just showing that like your access act data can come back arbitrarily delayed from the get. The only get requirement is that it makes forward progress. So it will, you will get an answer eventually, and you should wait for it. Um, but, similar, but conversely, you can get the answer back immediately. So you see, the first time you tried to send the get, the ready was low, so it got retried. But the get got its response on the same cycle. So those are like the extreme ends of how, how quickly answers come back. 
the opcode encodes what the message type is, uh, and the size says how big the block is. Right. Okay. So you've seen this picture before from Jack's talk, but I'm going to re re-show it. This is our chip. Yay! Um, so those are all the components. I, I think he talked a bit about the features, but I'm going to plaster it with our bus protocol. So you can see we've got TLC being used between the L1 and the L2 of the uh, U54 cores. Con over there, though, we have the E51. That's, uh, um, it's not got a data cache, so it doesn't actually need the coherent protocol. So it's speaking TLUH. So even though you have two different types of cores, they're using two different versions of the protocol to talk to the switch, and this all just works out. So you've got only two priorities from the E cores and all five from the, the U core and they talk to the L2, and the L2 is the last level cache in this design anyway, so it only uses TLUH going out to DDR. And then on the top there, we've got chip link, so that's our off-chip version, so it's crossing from the core to the FPGA, so it takes TLC from the FPGA to TLC on our chip. What this means, by the way, is if you buy this thing with the FPGA, you can put an accelerator on the FPGA, and it can actually take ownership of a block from our chip and take it to the FPGA. So if you're building an accelerator, you can have the cache local to your accelerator on the FPGA, because we have coherency across the chip. Um, and finally, you've got all these peripherals at the bottom here, like OTP, SPI, I2C, UART. So we actually implemented all of those slaves as TLUL, because it's just way easier to make slaves in this protocol. Like, you just have to read the address and do whatever it said, and you're done. Um, so we use the weakest protocol there, and we've got a couple adapters and stuff in rocket ships, so we turn it into a full-fledged TLUH protocol when it gets attached to the switch. But because the protocol is so lightweight, these if you look at these, these uh, uh, I guess it's no secret, people here have seen Chisel, right? If you look at the implementations of some of these modules, we're talking like eight lines of code sometimes, right? To implement, like, some, well, actually some of these are, yeah, anyway, whatever. The Maskrom, for example, would probably be about that ballpark. Anyway, um, so in conclusion, uh, Tilink is a, it has a public specification an open source implementation. It's trying to be a reduced message protocol, so trying to be as simple as possible, and it was specifically designed for RISC-V. So if you're already wedded to the AMBA protocols, well, probably nothing I say is gonna convince you to switch because you've got a big investment, but we can talk to you, right? We have, we have bridges, so we can hook up to your, your components and legacy stuff will continue to work. Um, if you're building a new RISC-V chip, though, why not consider using Tilink? And if you wanna learn more, um, there's a link to our, our spec, and these slides actually have a lot more slides in them, so I think they're gonna be posted in the proceedings. I just picked a selection of slides for this talk. There's a lot more showing you waveforms and how the protocol works, so these slides, as well as the spec, are a resource for additional information. Well, come see me after the break if you have any questions.